Hello Internet. Uh, now that I've calmed down from the Twin Peaks announcement uh, that uh, I heard with great maturity and thoughtfulness and uh, you can see video evidence of that a little further down the list of videos. Um, I'm going to do what I actually wanted to do tonight which was uh, talk about uh, Halloween 3, the season of the witch. The the red-headed stepchild of the Halloween franchise, uh, which I find fascinating. It's almost like a, a little glimpse into something that, that could have been. Uh, it doesn't have Michael Myers in it, and it, as a result, it doesn't get talked about much. I know that it's got its, its die-hard fans, and I know it's got people who wave the flag for Halloween 3. Um, but... Um, it's st it's still little mentioned, and I think it's very deserving of this sometimes series of mine uh, of, of underrated sequels, defending underrated sequels. And I'm probably I'm going to talk a little bit about the movie, but I'm probably also going to talk about um, what I think about uh, the wider context of the movie uh, and what it uh, what it tells us about. Um, the legacy of Halloween, the wider legacy of Halloween, not just for the Halloween franchise, but uh, for, for movies going forward. Uh, but we'll start with the details. Um, it was written and directed by uh, Tommy Lee Wallace. I'm going to be reading off a bit of paper, so excuse me. Uh, written and directed by Tommy Lee Wallace. He was the art director of the first Halloween movie, and he was actually... John Carpenter offered him the directing gig for Halloween 2, and he turned it down because he didn't like the script. But after Halloween 2, he got he got the chance to um, uh, write and direct Halloween 3. Uh, and having a quick look at his CV, he also co-wrote and directed Fright Night 2, which may appear in this underrated classics uh, series. I'm, I'm not sure. It's, it's not impossible to get your hands on it in the UK. So I'll have to try and get my hands on it and then watch it and see if it's deserving of a place. He also gets a writing credit on Amityville 2 The Possession, which is definitely at some future point going to form part of this sometimes series of underrated classics. So it looks like Tommy Lee Wallace is a bit of a sequels man and a bit of, a, a bit of an underrated sequels man. Um, he did the teleplay and directed the IT TV miniseries as well, which some people love and some people hate. Now... The original draft of this script for Halloween 3 was written by uh, a guy called Nigel Neal, um, a British guy. He used to he used to write for the BBC, and he used to and, and after that free freelancing. So, among a certain quarter of uh, genre fans, a bit of more of a crossover into uh, sci-fi than horror. But you know the the, the blurred lines of that. He cre uh, wrote, created, and wrote. Uh, the Quite a Mass TV series and um, had varying degrees of involvement in the Hammer remakes uh, of the Quite a Mass experiment and Quite a Mass in the Pit and Quite a Mass 2. And um, Neil asked for his credit to be, his writing credit to be taken off because he didn't like what was done to the script. I think we'll get back to that at the tail end of this. But it was, um, after Halloween 2, it was John Carpenter and Deborah Hill's intention. Those two uh, wrote Halloween. Uh, she, was, she was his producer, collaborator for a while with Halloween 2, The Fog, uh, and Halloween 3, and possibly some others. Uh, they intended for the Halloween series to be more like a, uh, a night gallery or a Twilight Zone type series. One film a year for Halloween, uh, around the theme of Halloween and certain of the Halloween traditions. Unfortunately, this film didn't um, perform as well as Halloween and Halloween 2 and Money Talks and Bullshit Walks and Mustafa Akkad, uh, the, the producer name that you'll see at the front of uh, most uh, now, uh, sadly not all, but most of the Halloween films. Um, 
Love Michael Myers. Bring back Michael Myers. The kids want Michael Myers. So Halloween became became Michael Myers rather than rather than a creep show type thing or a Twilight Zone type thing. And um, I think it's maybe a real missed opportunity. I'm going to walk a tightrope here because I don't want to necessarily diss the Michael Myers franchise. But I watch this, and I like this film in its own right. And and every time I watch it, I think, what what could the Halloween franchise have been, and what would have the further repercussions for horror cinema, or that phase of horror cinema, had been if if the public had really taken this anthology. Uh, anthology is not the right word, but uh, uh, the, uh, a thematic franchise rather than a character driven franchise to, to their hearts. And I think it would have been something. Um, a lot more interesting, something that, that we've we've never really seen and never seen since. I think it's an idea that's that, that's ripe uh, with potential. <clears throat> Let's talk briefly about the film itself. Um, I think it's it's really got the feel of um, one of these seventies paranoia infused uh, conspiracy uh, type films and um, it definitely goes for a more creepy and slightly more sci-fi vibe than than out and out horror and it makes it an interesting little piece of work it doesn't it doesn't obviously fit in with the rest of the franchise um, but it's got some connective tissue if you'll allow me to use that pretentious phrase. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of this. It's got an amazing stripped back score, um, co-written by John Carpenter himself. Uh, he co-wrote it with Alan Howarth, who collaborated with him on an awful lot of his early scores. So you've got a classic John Carpenter uh, synth style very simple score, um, not not as iconic as his Halloween score, uh, or even his, uh, or even the score for the Thing, uh, or uh, and uh, the Fog, but uh, uh, it's sparse. It's of its time. In this time, John Carpenter's scores, even though he was uh, producer only in this, I think his his scores are almost as iconic as, as some of his great movies. I think they go hand in glove, um, which is maybe an obvious thing to say. You don't necessarily uh, separate the score out from from the movie. Uh, the Indiana Jones theme works so well because it works in conjunction with, with the wonderful Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, but it gives a nice vibe to the movie. I love the I love the protagonist in this movie, this Doctor character played by um, genre favourite Tom Atkins with his amazing moustache. Uh, he's an alcoholic doctor uh, with an ex-wife and two kids and he's a shagger. He's a drinker and a shagger and um, he enlists the help of a, uh, a female pathologist that you just know in their short scene together that, that they'd had a fling. He has a fling with uh, the daughter of, of the patient who dies under his watch. He just he just goes through his life saving patients, turning up at the hospital, either drunk or not drunk, or waiting to have another drink, and uh, waiting for someone else to shag. And I could really get behind him. You don't really see many protagonists like that anymore these days. And um, the villain of the piece is... Uh, delicious. I'm going to completely blank on the actor's name and that is uh, my crime and I apologise for it. He plays the head of OCP in Robocop. With this uh, role, uh, the head of the Silver Shamrock Company and it's his uh, big evil scheme that we, we slowly find out about. He plays it with such a, tw a twinkly eye and full of Irish charm and um, almost childlike glee at the horrific plan he's got to k 
kill as many children as he possibly can on Halloween night as a grand uh, Samhain sacrifice. Uh, he's of the, the old religion. He would... I think him and Christopher Lee's Lord Summer Isle from The Wicker Man would have a wonderful time together at a cocktail party uh, talking about uh, uh, the old ways and traditions and uh, blood sacrifices and the like. They would get on like an absolute house on fire. I've, I've no doubt about that. Mm. I'm drinking warm milk that was just a bit of milk film sorry that probably looks disgusting um the film builds nicely it's a bit shonky um but it it, it builds nicely the paranoia builds nicely there's a few nice twists um the evil guy's plan is absolutely fucking nuts. So bonkers. He steals one of the um, uh, one of the Stonehenge <laughs> stones to get bits of Stonehenge rock to put chips in microchips in his Halloween masks. And at the allotted time, all the kids are told to to come back for a special Silver Shamrock TV broadcast, which will turn their heads into insects and snakes. Uh, oh, how, how could I have talked about the score without mentioning the amazing <laughs> jingle that runs uh, throughout the movie for Silver Shamrock that every time you watch this movie, it's an earworm and it goes round and round and round in your head for the next two or three days. Um, the ending of the movie is really bleak as well. Um, again, like these um, 70s paranoid thrillers like Coma or Westworld or, or, or things... Uh, like that, it's kind of a bleak, harsh ending. I, I really like it. But what this movie tells us is the sea change in horror movies that came about because of John Carpenter's Halloween. Now, when John Carpenter and Deborah Hill and those guys were making Halloween, they just wanted to make a movie. And you see any interviews with John Carpenter from the time, or even later in hindsight, that those kids just wanted to make a movie. Uh, and it was a low-budget movie. And um, he, was, he was inspired by the films of Hitchcock and how to build tension. And it's not a very bloody film. But what, either by accident or design, he stumbled upon was the perfect template for what was to become uh, the slasher movie. Uh, and then uh, other film students who came along, and that movie made a shit ton of money. Let's make no mistakes, the budget was tiny, and it made a ridiculous amount of money. And again, money talks and bullshit walks. And I take a through line from Halloween through to Friday the 13th and Sean Cunningham and he wanted to make his horror movie uh, and um, he realised that uh, the only way to get... Sean Cunningham is not a superior filmmaker. John Carpenter was, for quite a long, prolonged period of time, a superlative filmmaker. Halloween, um, The Fog, The Thing, Escape from New York, Big Trouble in Little China. This guy was, he was all over it. Uh, we won't talk about his subsequent career because I want to stay positive. Sean Cunningham, um, the guy behind Friday the 13th, is not a superb filmmaker. Um, he tended more towards the exploitation end of cinema, which is all well and good. That has its place. Um, but Friday the 13th certainly rode the wave of Halloween. But what it, the little extra, the little push over the edge that it brought was, was the gore, the kills, the special effects. 
And if you watch uh, any documentary about the making of, uh, or listen to any of his commentaries about the making of subsequent John Carpenter films, uh, the unintended effects of the success of Halloween affected the way he subsequently made movies. Um, he filmed and edited The Fog and watched the final edit. And he says so in the commentary to The Fog. Uh, there were no jumps. It wasn't scary enough. But when he set out, he wanted to make a quintessential campfire ghost story movie. And what he did is he went back and he reshot and put some gore into it. Put the, put the zombies, uh, more zombie shots, more kills and more blood into it. Uh, he handed over the directing reins of um, Halloween 2. He didn't want to direct it. He wrote it with Deborah Hill, but handed over the directing reins to Rick Rosenthal. And you can read up. Rick Rosenthal made the movie he wanted to make, and he made it in the vein and the template of the original movie. He wanted it to be a companion piece uh, of, of a theme. And Carpenter went back and did some reshoots because... Um, horror movies had moved on a pace in the, just in the year between those two movies um, and he went in and he, he added uh, nudity and he added uh, gore um, and the reason Nigel Neal took his writing credit off Halloween 3 is because um, more gratuitous violence was added and um, you it's it, in a bizarre way, his horror thriller, Halloween, which has minimal, minimal gore, uh, spawned a movement of films that was a, more and more about extremes and what you show uh, and, and nudity and blood and guts. And it seems to me that Carpenter was caught up in this vortex and wanted to make a campfire ghost story, wanted to make a, uh, uh, sequels to, to Halloween, wanted Halloween to be this, this anthology thing around the theme, but then had to go back and tinker uh, and, and add more shocks and add, add more gore. He, he'd become caught up in this whole thing that he had unintentionally created. And we reach a point where because Halloween 3 is not particularly gory and it's not about Michael Myers at all uh, the producers get the willies and decide to try and course correct the franchise and we get uh, Halloween 4 the return of Michael Myers now that means that we get some excellent things we get more Donald Pleasance I'm, I'm down with that uh, we get introduced to Danielle Harris, who, uh, first time I watched Halloween 4 and 5, I genuinely couldn't believe how good this child actress was. Uh, an awful lot of child actresses and actors, um, they, they don't work. But when they work, they, they can work like gangbusters, and she was, she was something to behold. There was, there was real, genuine threat from Michael in those movies because of her, I feel, and her performance. I, I bought it. I bought her terror. The, the downside is... Um, the downside is that we get, eventually, uh, Buster Rhymes karate-kicking Michael Myers in Halloween Resurrection and destroying the franchise to such a point that it then needs to be rebooted with um, Rob Zombie's contentious two films. I won't talk specifically about my thoughts on Rob, the Rob Zombie Halloween movies, but they divide opinion. I think that would be fair to say. Um, and I just wonder what we could have had if we hadn't if Halloween 2 hadn't have been the continuation of Michael Myers, if Halloween 2 had been a standalone Halloween movie. Because let's be honest here, between you and me, let's, let's talk honestly. Michael Myers' story was finished at the end of part 2. Both of his eyes were shot out and he had burnt to an absolute crisp. Um, bringing him back really didn't make any sense, uh, narrative-wise. Um, 
just like I feel Friday the 13th, the final chapter, is the final story really, if we're being really, really honest, the final Jason story. I happen to think that uh, Friday the 13th Part 4 is the perfect distillation of what those uh, first three films were building towards. It's, it's my favourite Friday the 13th movie. I think they took everything that Friday the 13th was and purified it down uh, and gave us Friday the 13th, the final chapter. And then the story's done. Um, they tried to continue that franchise. The fans didn't like the different direction they were taking, so they brought back Jason. Do we see a pattern evolving here? Jason comes back as a zombie. Uh, Michael comes back mildly burned and has managed to regenerate both of his eyes. It just... And then, part six, whatever version you watch, with the, the, thorn, the cult of Thorn, and all these continuing ridiculous reasons to bring Michael back, I've got love for them. I'm not hating on them. But somewhere out there, there's an alternate reality. There's an alternate timeline where Halloween 3 really took off. And once a year, every year, with John Carpenter at, at the helm, to some extent, uh, with Deborah Hill, would have uh, given uh, an eager young director the chance to take the reins on a relatively low budget, we're only talking two, two and a half million dollars here, a relatively low budget horror movie with a, with a franchise uh, recognition name attached to it, uh, enabling them to explore um, the story that they want to tell just around the theme of Halloween. And we would have had some stinkers and we would have had some excellent stuff. Um, and Halloween would have been completely different to what uh, we know today. Um, and maybe for a time, horror movies would have been completely different um, without this continued drive to bring uh, the villain back and back and back. Would we, would we necessarily have had seven Saw movies? Um, now, don't get me wrong, I like um, some of what is done in some of those Saw movies. I think it's very clever. But um, the first Saw was written as a standalone thriller. Uh, yeah, it was, it, it was gory, but it was nowhere near as uh, hellishly gory as some of the, the later films. Um, and the story was told. But we're seeing the pattern repeat again bring Jigsaw back, let's tell more of his story, let's get more extreme. Some of the traps become uh, so full on that you're thinking, well, how, can, how is he managing to pull this off? Some of the subsequent films attempt to address that. And I'm an absolute continuity fiend, so for me, the Saw movies are continuity porn. Um, but again, some good in quality, some not good in quality. Um, Imagine if the Paranormal Activity series had just been the banner, Paranormal Activity, and each film was a different story with different supernatural things happening, rather than having to tie it into a grand scheme, a grand story. Um, imagine uh, of a Halloween going into the next Paranormal Activity movie and not knowing what it was going to be about. Fresh characters, fresh story. I think we missed a trick, and I think Halloween 3 shows the first few steps on a path that sadly wasn't taken. I like Michael Myers, don't get me wrong. Uh, but the idea of a Halloween-themed franchise... As fun as uh, in October uh, working your way through all the Halloween movies is, imagine if Halloween 2, Halloween 3, Halloween 4, Halloween 5, Halloween 6 were all different stories, all different characters. One's about a killer, one's about 
um, uh, a mad Irish pagan blood sacrifice guy that wants to kill all the children in America. What would the next one have been about? What would the one after that have been about? The mind boggles. It could have been amazing. But um, the money men got scared and... I don't know. Maybe they were right. Maybe the people did want more Michael, more Michael, more Michael. We will never know. The only hint of what could have been is Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, which I don't think deserves to be ignored. I, I think it was a bold experiment and a little glimpse at that alternate parallel timeline where... Gore wasn't king, and original stories could have had their time to shine once a year under a recognisable uh, banner title. Maybe we'll see something like that sometime soon. Maybe we'll never see anything like that. If that's the case, well, we've got Halloween 3, and I submit that it's worthy of your consideration for all its flaws.